Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Amazon, proud sponsor of WPLN's daily show, This Is Nashville, engaging our differences so we can discover our unity. More on Amazon's community work at aboutamazon.com. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. If you live here in Nashville, you know how much the city is growing and changing. There's construction everywhere, in downtown and in the suburbs. Thousands of construction workers on the ground are working in our city and across the state. Tragically, Tennessee is one of the most dangerous states in the country when it comes to construction, worker, on-the-job injury and deaths. In 2022, the last year we have data for, 43 people died on the job in private construction industry in Tennessee. Now, joining us now to discuss the state of worker safety in Tennessee and Nashville are Molly Davis from The Tennessean and Cindy Abrams, WPLN's Metro, Metro reporter. Molly and Cindy, welcome to This is Nashville. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Really great to have you both. Okay, so Molly, you recently wrote a story for The Tennessean about a study that ranks Tennessee among the most dangerous states for construction work. The story quotes Jason Davidson of Iron Workers Local 492 saying that workers are, quote, tired of carrying caskets. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, for a little context, cover growth and development uh, for the Tennessean. And at times that means covering the construction industry. And so I was really shocked, actually, to hear that the fatality rate for construction workers here in Tennessee ranks really highly across the nation. We're ranked third um, for f- fatalities per 100,000 workers. We're right at around uh, 129 fatalities per 100,000 workers here in the state. Um, mm. So that kind of gives you an idea of of the scope of the issue. Oh, so big picture wise, like why is Tennessee ranked as one of the most ha- dangerous places to work? And how was that determined? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the reasons is that fatality rate. So deaths per 100,000 workers is a decent way to compare data state by state. Um, and then also another factor is the number of citations that are issued in the state. So we have a pretty high number of OSHA citations issued on construction sites, which suggests that safety standards by and large, are not really being met in the state. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of, of, of why things are f- considered more dangerous uh, on the job here. Um, and, I mean, there's a host of, of factors that could be contributing to that. Now, now the major, I want to talk about stakeholders real quick. The, the major stakeholders in construction sites are the workers themselves, unions, developers, and subcontractors, and agencies like TOSHA, Tennessee Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the T- Tennessee Department of Labor. Then legislatures who are involved in passing regulations, you've interviewed individuals across all of these groups. The numbers are clear in terms of injury and deaths. But can 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 you walk us through the roles of the different stakeholders when it comes to worker safety? Yeah. So TOSHA is the regulating body of worker safety. And so their role is really one that is of oversight and um accountability. So um, that's 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 one stakeholder. And then we have the in, locally here in Nashville, there's local lawmakers that are working on the issue, trying to add layers of oversight, um, especially where it comes to metro owned construction sites. And then in, in, in addition to the workers, there's also the union groups and advocacy organizations that represent them and are really trying to speak up about the issue. Okay. So I want to talk about subcontractors. Yeah. General contractors who run a site are supposed to be responsible for everyone's safety. But these contractors, they bring in subcontractors for additional or specialized labor. How do subcontractors complicate subcontractors? How do they complicate the reality of worker safety and what's going on on the sites? Yeah. So subcontractors offer specialized labor and uh, in specific trades on construction sites. So that can range anything from um, plumbing, electrical work, finishing and painting jobs. And so they're, they're a part of the industry. They're a reality in the industry. And uh, general contractors hire them on. And uh, a lot of general contractors will ensure that subcontractors that they work with adhere to certain safety records, certain trainings are necessary for laborers on the job. Um, but businesses, representatives of TOSHA and advocates that I spoke to in my reporting all pointed to this idea that layers and layers of subcontractors can be a challenge to accountability and safety. And then uh, meanwhile, 
several lawsuits that are have been filed in the Metro Nashville area actually point to a breakdown of communication between general contractors and subcontractors as a major contributing factor to unsafe working conditions and ultimately deaths of workers. Is it is it some sort of by hiring layers and layers of subcontractors from a major a contractor, is that some way of kind of finding a loophole? I don't know that it's a loophole as much as businesses that I spoke to really stress the importance of training across the board. And sometimes uh, huge challenges to that training include um, language barriers. Mm. So, you know, businesses that I spoke to who have high safety standards, high safety records, rather, um, they really emphasize that training in in workers' native language, which at a lot of times is Spanish. Um, so so they offer trainings in English and Spanish. And um, that's that's really what they stress is those safety standards that the general contractor holds themselves to need to be consistent all the way down the line to every individual laborer. Okay, so I want to ask you that. Are the safety standards, do all of the stakeholders see this problem the same way? Do they agree that worker safety is a real issue in our state? It's hard to say that everyone's on the same page. I think people generally understand that safety is very important. For example, um, businesses that I spoke to, they really stress the importance of safety because these are the um, workers who are building Nashville, building their projects, and um, any injuries or death really gets in the way of that and ultimately harms the worker population. Um, and so I think in terms of businesses, they're really, they really do think that it's an issue and they want it to be solved. Now, there are limitations. So, if, for example, in the, um, the resources that the TOSHA office has in Tennessee, there aren't a the, the number of inspectors has not changed in several years. And obviously the construction activity has has changed. It's gone up. Um, and so when TOSHA inspectors aren't working on investigating deaths or injuries and aren't investigating complaints, the hundreds of complaints that come their way every month, then they have the opportunity to visit construction sites. So it's pretty much impossible for TOSHA to be on top of every construction site, let alone the state. But I mean, Nashville in itself. That's correct. And I think what a lot of advocates are questioning is in the absence of TOSHA being able to visit every construction site, they they ask who is responsible, who is holding s- these companies accountable for safety measures and who is ultimately taking care of the workers who are building our city. Now, based on your reporting, what do you th- really think is at the heart of why people are getting hurt and dying on the job. Is is the problem a lack of regulations? Is there an issue with oversight and accountability for current regulations, or is there something else at play? It's hard to say exactly what's at the heart of the issue, but what I can offer is what I mentioned before about Tosha's lack of um, resources enough to visit every single construction site. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, in, in lieu of that, uh, I did talk to some businesses that are engaging third-party consultants to inspect their safety plans on their sites. That's something that they're um, using to add another layer of accountability. But there are a number of factors contributing to the issue of safety. Earlier, you mentioned that local politicians, local lawmakers are seeking to have new regulations. And as a matter of fact, after the break, we're going to have council member Sandra Sepulveda, who has been kind of a leading person in Metro Council on that effort. That's people who are pushing for regulations. Have you spoken to anyone who is against the establishment of more regulations here? I haven't spoken to anyone who's against the establishment of more regulation. But I will note that locally here in Nashville, there's a, there's a desire to add more oversight for certain, um, more regulation, meaning more stringent safety measures isn't necessarily something that people I spoke to, um, think is a solution. They, they really agree though, that more oversight as in more inspections and site visits to some of these places is something that could improve safety. Oversight leads to accountability. 
What kind of ca- accountability measures currently exist for companies and or contractors or subcontractors who violate these safety regulations? Yeah, so when TOSHA visits a site and finds that a safety measure was violated, they will issue citations and associated fines. So that's the main layer of accountability is, is, is those thousands of dollars of fines that are issued when, when, when a safety measure is violated. So the, I was about to ask, like, what's the, what, what's the average number value of these fines? Well, for example, in the case of the death of 16-year-old Gustavo Ramirez, who died at the site of the La Quinta Inn and Suites in, on the East Bank, there was about a little more than fifteen thousand dollars worth of fines issued to um, the, the companies uh, that hired him on that site, and that was due to serious safety violations. Mm. And then, in the case of uh, more recent death of Dennis Bache in October of twenty twenty three, two companies were fined a total of eleven thousand five hundred dollars in, in in serious safety violations that TOSHA found led to. That individual's death. Can you can you tell us a little bit more about Gustavo Ramirez? What happened? The circumstances that led to his death, and what's happened since then? Yeah. So Gustavo Ramirez was 16 years old when he fell from the scaffolding of. Okay, I just want to stop you right there. Yes. 16 years old working on a construction site. How is that legal? It's not. Okay. Well, it's not in terms of the work that he was doing on the site. So he was at working at high levels on scaffolding that on uh, an, an 11 story building. And so when, when he fell from this scaffolding, um, he, he died and that was in 2020. Mm. And oh, a, a few months after that, a wrongful death lawsuit was filed against the company. And that lawsuit is set to have discovery begin later this year. So it's been, it's been, a, a lengthy legal process for this family. Are you going to be following that as that lawsuit unfolds? Yes, absolutely. All right. Now, Cindy, as the WPLN Metro reporter, you've been reporting on worker safety here in the city. Nashville Metro Council has worked to pass legislation last year and this year. Can you can you tell us what happened last year with the, I believe it's called the Get It Right Bill, who was involved and what were they hoping to accomplish? Yeah, so the Metro Council has been trying to address worker safety for quite a while, at least as it pertains to Metro's work sites. So back in 2021, council members, construction workers, and advocates worked to come up with the Get It Right law, which would have set more stringent standards for awarding contracts to Metro construction sites. More specifically, Metro would have refused to contract with companies that had major workplace violations like death or wage theft within the last three years. Um, It was introduced by council member Sandra Sepulveda and had five other co-sponsors, one of which was now our now mayor, Freddie O'Connell. Okay, now in big picture, the state, TOSHA, and DOL regulate workers' safety. What was Metro hoping to do that the state wasn't exactly? Ultimately, I think Metro was hoping hoping to set a higher standard for the the contractors that they employ. This didn't apply to all construction sites in Nashville, just Metro's sites. But I think that it was trying to set a higher standard for um, contractors. What happened with the legislation? So even though the council did ultimately approve the legislation, it had already been preempted by the state. Um, Preemption is a legal doctrine that allows a higher level of government to limit or even at times eliminate the power of a lower level government. So in this case, while the council bill was being drafted, the state legislature passed a law that prevented local governments from setting the standards that Nashville was trying to set. Um, The council went ahead and passed the bill anyway. And while Sepulveda, the bill's sponsor, said she didn't want to back down from a fight with the state, the mayor at the time, which was John Cooper, did back down. Um, Every year, the mayor selects different priorities to lobby the state for, and worker safety didn't make his cut. Were you surprised by what happened? Um, You know, I wasn't covering Metro at the time, but I think kind of placing it within the context of the next couple of years when we saw a slew of preemption bills aimed at Nashville, it's not necessarily a surprising event to see the desires of the Metro Council thwarted by the legislature. Now this past October, Dennis Bache, 20 years old, um, you know, fell to his death while repairing 
the roof at Glencliff High School. That was a part of a Metro contract, from what I understand. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about what happened there? Yeah. Um, so Dennis Bache was a 20-year-old man who was working on the roof of Glencliff High School. Um, he had moved to the United States from Guatemala, and his family says he had little to no training in roofing work. Um, a cousin of his spoke at a press conference that Sandra Sepulveda put together a few months ago, and um, he said that Dennis was the main source of income for his family. He also mentioned that his family had a lot of trouble securing Dennis's body in the immediate aftermath, um, but eventually they were able to, through a GoFundMe, um, get his body back to Guatemala. Now, you took up a Metro on another bill that was there called the Build It Right bill this year. What's in this bill, and was it similar at all to last year's? Yeah, so another bill is back, um, and this time it does fit within the parameters that have been set out by the state. Um, It establishes a contract and compliance board with a dedicated staff to oversee work sites, again, in which Metro is a participant. So, again, it only oversees Metro's work sites, not all Nashville work sites. Um, But it will investigate complaints and audit contracts. And it will not have enforcement authority, but it can turn over its findings to federal or state regulators. What kind of support does it have within council and also the mayor's office? Pretty significant backing. More than two dozen council members signed on early as co-sponsors. And the mayor, Freddie O'Connell, expressed his support very early Um, I will say he expressed early on hesitation because he had proposed his uh, budget at the time, which didn't have any allocation for this board. And because it has a dedicated staff, it does require funding. Where did Metro Council find the funding for this? So if you recall a month ago, um, the Metro Council passed a substitute budget in Mm -hmm. lieu of Mayor O'Connell's budget. Um, this alternative plan was put forth by budget and finance chair Delicia Porterfield and was ultimately endorsed by the mayor. Um, and she was able to find some extra dollars in the city's reserve funds for a number of different initiatives, one of which was the Build It Right bill. What's the update for the bill? What's the pro- Where's the process at now? Um, you know, we'll need to check in with Sandra, but I, the budget was only pro- passed a month ago. Um, so I... My guess is that it's still pretty early on and they need to hire a staff. You you both are keeping an eye on worker safety and things. What, as you both continue to follow stories, Molly, you first. What are you keeping an eye on? What are you looking out for? There's a couple things that I keep in mind when covering this issue. One of them is the, and, and, and you mentioned this a little bit, but the the significant financial burden that comes with loss of life and serious injury. So not only are families of victims losing loved ones, but they're also losing wages. I mean, these wages that support families and their well-being, they're paying for medical care and funeral expenses. And even in the case of serious injury, they're losing wages and losing needed support for family. So that's that's one thing I keep in mind about these kind of long standing impacts to families who are dealing with this issue. And then also Tennessee heat. There's mm-hmm. a slew of things that go into construction worker safety heat being among them. When I talked to businesses about heat in particular, they said there's a lot of lack of knowledge and a lack of awareness about how dangerous heat can be. Deaths in Tennessee on construction sites include heat stroke. And that's that's something that I'm definitely keeping in mind as I cover this issue throughout the summer. Thank you, Cindy. Yeah. uh, You know, I think I'm interested to see the progression with the contract and compliance board. Um, But I'm also looking to the East Bank. You know, it's a massive project and will require years and decades of work. And we've already seen the master developer sign a memorandum of understanding with the local chapter of a labor union. So related to worker safety and worker pay and other benefits. So I'm interested to see if um, these standards set within the East Bank will um, be prevalent in other parts of the city. I want to thank you both for being here. Molly Davis is a reporter for The Tennessean, and Cynthia Abrams is WPLN's Metro reporter. We'll have a link to Molly's recent article about construction worker safety and Cindy's reporting on the Metro Council on the web post for today's episode. Again, thanks to you both, and thanks for your reporting. Thanks so much for having us. 
All right, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll be speaking with Metro Council members Sandra Sepulveda and labor union organizer Charlie Rodriguez about the recent legislation. Stay with us. This is Nashville. Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for PrEP and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Kaliole Colonna, and this is Nashville. Welcome back. Welcome back. Today, we are talking about construction worker safety here in Tennessee. We're turning our attention now to the recent action at the Nashville Metro Council has taken to address construction worker safety on Metro specific contracts. Joining us to tell us more is Metro Council member Sandra Sepulveda and Charlie Rodriguez, a labor leader in the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. Council member Sepulveda, Charlie, thank you both so much for being here. Welcome back. Welcome back in your case and welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. Thank you for having us. All right, so I, I want to talk about personal connections a little bit. I want to start with you, Council Member Sepulveda. For any, you mentioned this a little bit when you were here on the show for a profile interview a few months ago. But for anyone who didn't has, hasn't able to listen to that episode, you know we understand that workers and safety rights are your top priority list when you were first elected onto Metro Council. Can you just re-explain to us why that's so important to you and your constituents? Yeah, having family who has worked in construction and continue to work in construction, um, it had always been a top priority. Um, Also representing one of the districts that has the largest uh, Latinx population in the county. Um, And we all know that one third of all construction workers are Latinos. And so um, it was important to me to also address um, some of their concerns. Now, Charlie, you help organize workers for the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. Tell me what your work looks like day to day. Day to day, it is interacting with workers either by phone when I get phone calls from them, going on job sites, um, seeing how they're doing and just representing the people that do our trades really is what entails my whole work and how it gets driven to go out there and speak with them and see what's going on and how I can help them. Because whatever work we do, we know that it elevates the standards out there. Briefly, tell me how you got into this work. I was recruited coming out of the Air Force. Um, somebody decided to give me a shot. I went to a boot camp with 20 people. Um, and from there, it was decided that three of us were the best fit for this job. Um, and there were similar scenarios like what we went through with the legislation that were role playing. And that's where really I popped out a lot. And that's what and it, it came into fruition, you know, doing it. Mm, tell me why it's impo- important for you to do this work. I mean, one of those things is just you think about it and how important a job is and a job with benefits and a career, right? Think about people who are right now living in places of poverty where they don't have access to good jobs. They're just dead-end jobs, right? It's not a career. But think about if they got a shot to be part of a great job, a great career that pays them benefits. It transforms their whole life and not just their life, but their family's life. Imagine taking them out of those circumstances. It changes everything. Now, you moved to Nashville three years ago from Arizona. I moved here three years ago from New Mexico. When you got here, tell me, what was your take on worker safety in the city, in Nashville? It was just remarkable to see that you could go on any job site and really just find wage theft, find a lot of safety concerns going on. Um, Workers just willing to talk to you and tell you that they're being discriminated against, the conditions that they're working in. Um, it, It was just horrible to see that this crisis was going on and how we got here. Did you see similar things when you were in Arizona? For the most part, no. Over there, it's different. Uh, Arizona, that New Mexico's uh, area too as well, uh, there's more oversight and there's more safety. Not that safety incidents don't happen, Mm -hmm. right? Um, But no, nothing like this over here in the southeast. There's a lot of jobs here in Nashville, a lot of opportunities, but there's challenges that go with them. What are you both hearing from workers about what's important to them as they go to take on these jobs? Council member? Yeah, I I mean, it's basic safety, right? People are worried if they're going to come home in one piece or come home at all. 
uh, wages are being stolen left to right. Um, we have a system where the subcontractor and a subcontractor of that subcontractor and people just keep passing the buck. And um, there's not a whole lot of dignity. Um, and, and it's tough to see. Um, people are just trying to make a living, just trying to support their families um, and live an honest life. And it's it's sad to see that their lives aren't valued as much. Now, Charlie, you mentioned that, you know, you spoke to some workers and they're concerned about wage theft and discrimination. Anything else that they talk to you about that's a high, high priority for them? Um, just to reiterate, safety, safety, wage theft, um, discrimination. I mean, it's a ripple effect in our community. This doesn't just affect construction workers. It affects everybody. Because think about it. If they're being stolen from and they're 40 hours and they're not getting that money, then they can't make ends meet. They can't pay their bills. They can't pay their rent. Um, sometimes they cash their checks over at a local market. Now that local market's out money and it affects everybody and it drives down the standards of living. Mm. Now, I, I, I want to talk about focus on the build at right bill because, you know, it's one thing for you know, to improve worker safety is another thing to decide on the specific goal of legislation and to move through and the process of local government, which is your field, council member. You know, the bill applies to metro contracts only and would establish a board to monitor the city's government construction process and make sure they have it established for safe working conditions. What were your main priorities with that bill as you were drafting it and working it through? Yeah, so uh, we worked on it for almost a year, um, myself, Charlie, and Ethan Link from La Una. Um, and we started off, you know, kicking around ideas and ultimately uh, this is where we landed. Um, so we knew we could focus on specific metro construction sites because that's what we have purview over. Um, we knew that, you know, we're not auditing our contracts. Uh, they'll go through the procurement process and then each department is in charge of auditing their contracts and we just haven't been doing that. We know that OSHA and TOSHA don't have enough inspectors and so we knew that we needed people on the ground. So having safety specialists be able to, you know, look at our contracts, um, be on the side if there happen to be any violations, you know, taking that, well, the board still has to be put in place, but ideally they would take that to the board. Um, the board would have some, you know, standards, maybe a warning or so to let the construction uh, company know, hey, you have these violations, you should probably correct those, you know, and if that's not corrected, then that could be moved on up to federal agencies. But this is uh, the first time that we're actually able to have something tangible, um, because when we tried this, uh, as it was stated a couple of years ago, the state already went ahead and preempted us. Now there's the possibility that they do that again. Um, and I think that the public needs to be watching out to see if the state's going to give in to um, big corporations and lobbyists or if they're going to, you know, hold up worker safety first. You talked about a little bit about the responsibilities of the board. Who will make up the board? And can you give me an idea of the scope of their work and their reach? Yeah, so the scope is still going to need to be drafted as soon as the board gets in there, but we'll probably be able to contract out to, because there are different cities who do this already, who have something similar set up. Um, so we're not starting from zero, but the board will have to, you know, tailor it for Nashville. The board will be made up of a number of members. Um, one council member who's a non-voting member will be on there. The mayor has the ability to appoint a couple of people. The council will appoint some people. Um, we made sure to have a representative of labor on there and a representative of the construction industry. Were there limitations with this bill? I mean, there's always limitations. Uh, we took it to the different departments. We took it to Metro Legal, you know, making sure that legal signed off um, in the in the case that, you know, the state tries to preempt us and overreach because they do overreach, um, that we can be able to defend this in court. Charlie, you were involved with the bill. Tell me how you ended up working on it and what was that process of drafting it like for you? Really, it was just bringing together all the labor knowledge that has been bestowed upon me by my mentors, um, going out there and talking with workers and elevating their voices. Um, ultimately, that's what it was. It was looking at the contract that 
was with MNPS and being able to work together and find out, hey, was this done? Was this done? Oh, none of this. And going forward with it and really just being more of a consulting and elevating workers' voices for Sandra to understand things. What are you hoping for with this legislation? First and foremost, protect workers. I mean, I, I believe if you protect workers and their safety and they can go home at the end of the day, then I believe it also safeguards Metro and stops them from being sued. And that's public taxpayers' money as well that's not being lost. Have you heard from workers and businesses about this, the legislation? I've heard from workers. They seem very excited. Um, they're very hopeful. And that's something that hasn't been seen in a while, hope in workers that things could change and things could get better. Now, Councilmember Sepulveda, you've been working on this issue since you got elected. It was one of your the pillars of your, your campaign. You worked on this bill last year. It was preempted by the state. You've come back with this new one. What lessons did you take from the experience of how of what happened last year, and how did you how did you work that into your strategy for this bill this year? Yeah, we took the time needed to work out all the kinks, right? And unfortunately, in between the time that we started working on it till the time it passed, we did have a fatality happening. Um, so it, it's it's the downside of making sure we check all our boxes to um, give workers the best chance. Uh, we had a much more like robust uh, comms plan. We stacked our sponsors. As, as you all know, we had the majority of the council signed on. It passed unanimously um, on third. Um, and uh, we had a social media campaign. We had a press conference. We went out there, tried to get the word out as much as possible, did interviews, um, and tried to educate the public. Um, we tried to bring everyone to the table as much as we could. But when you try and do something new, uh, people get a little nervous. And, um, you know, we saw a little bit of that. But um, I don't know. I, I feel very optimistic if this works in Nashville, one of the most dangerous cities to work in construction in the South. Um, maybe we could see this implemented in different cities uh, across the Southeast um, and it could change lives, it could save lives. Um, our goal is to make Nashville construction sites the, safety, the safest in, in the whole state. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Kaliale Colonna. We're talking this hour about safety for construction workers. My guests are Metro Council member Sandra Sepulveda and Charlie Rodriguez. Now, I'm going to talk about workers' rights and issues. Safety is not the only issue facing workers. Wage theft is a real problem. Charlie, can you tell us more what's going on with rate, wage, fest, wage theft pardon me, and what it looks like? Wage theft looks like not being paid your 40 hours that you worked or not being paid the overtime. Um, and most job sites where I go and I talk to workers who in our trades, they almost laugh when I bring up overtime because they say, well, I'm not paid overtime. We're just paid at the normal rate. And I was like, do you know that is a violation of the law? And they're like, yeah, we're aware of it. And they're like, well, how do we do something about it? And it's going out there and educating what they can do about it and empowering them. But that's what wage set looks like when you're not paid your wages correctly. And like I said, it's a ripple effect in our community that we're seeing. When I was in New Mexico, I, the first time I came across wage theft were people who went to cash their paychecks and they came bouncing back to them. Has that been an issue out here? Absolutely. I mean, we, we see it so much and uh, we get workers calling us saying that, hey, they, they wrote this fraudulent check, this check bounce. Um, now the, the place that I went and cashed it at, they've put my photo on the store window. They're mm -hmm. calling me a criminal. Um, it's affecting me drastically in my mental health. My family is getting shamed. And it's not their fault. It's the contractor that wrote a fraudulent check, but it's easier to go after the work and intimidate them to get the money back than do a whole civil thing because it is a civil thing once it mm. goes further on. You're speaking with these workers. They're telling you of their experiences and what they're going through. Are they willing to speak up if they see a problem? Are they willing to file a claim from the subcontractor or about against, I'm sorry, the subcontractor or contractor they're working for? Are they willing to file a claim and speak up at their own defense? We are starting to see it, yes, now. We, we are starting to see that people want to stand up, people want to change, because that's how we got to this point where there's wage theft happening on just about every site out there, is that people weren't doing anything about it, and now they understand that if they want to see the change, they must be a part of that change. What would you tell a worker who sees a huge, big safety issue on a job site? What would you tell them? How would you advise them to move forward? Because they see this issue, but they're worried about saying something. First and foremost, I mean, just 
See if you can fix it there. Go tell your supervisor. Go tell the general contractor what's going on. Maybe the general contractor doesn't even know what's going on. Maybe the supervisor doesn't know. And I mean, that would be the first avenue. And if they tell you to go kick rocks, well, then there's numbers for that. There's TOSHA, there's OSHA. Um, there's myself going out there too. Um, the, the, there's a lot of ways to go about it and getting eyes on it and changing things. Are you seeing more workers feeling more empowered to go out and speak up and on their own de- at their own behest? Absolutely. And I mean, the, the media here in Nashville has done a great job of empowering workers too as well, because there's been several cases that have gone to DOL wage and hour, and they've been publicized and shown that workers coming together and fighting for what's theirs and what they've earned, not what they deserve, what they've earned. And, th- and then that's how they get it. Now, construction work and safety is an issue that obviously impacts the workers, their families directly. What would you both like everyday citizens who might not know a construction worker? What do you want them to know about how they can help make this city a safer place for everyone? Council member? Yeah, I, I think being advocates is important. Right. When we have legislation, go out there, call your council member support. Um, if there's a protest going on, um, show up. If there's a vigil where the public is invited, show up because families need support as well. Um, and when the state tries to overreach and preempt, um, then show up there as well. We're going to need a lot of help when this session starts because I'm already hearing that um, they already have a legislator who's going to be the sponsor of the preemption bill for for Build It Right. And so we have to work even harder. Um, so the more you could be involved, please do so. If you have family members, uh, loved ones who are being taken advantage of, you know, reach out to the unions. Uh, they're there to help. And um, workers who build this city need to be taken care of. Charlie, what do you, what do you want people to know how to make this place safer? Just speak up, come together. I mean, the, the, she put it the best way possible that, I mean, it can put. Um, just speak up, say something, elevate your voice, because I, I can't do this for you, and neither can she. You have to do something, too, and you have to come forward and say something. So if you see something, say something. I really want to thank you both for being here. Sa- Sandra Sepulveda is a council member, and she is going to leave us now. But coming back after the break, Charlie Rodriguez will stay with us again. Thanks to you both for being here. Thank you. We're going to say one last break. When we come back, we'll talk about what every worker needs to know about what to do if you get injured while working. You can always join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. All right, welcome back. For most of today's episode, we've been talking about the dangers of construction work and sites. But any type of workplace can have both obvious and hidden dangers that could lead to workers a workers' compensation claim. Joining us to tell us more about what workers need to know about getting injured on the job is Troy Haley, the administrator for the Tennessee Bureau of Workers' Compensation. And staying with us after the break is Charlie Rodriguez. He's a labor organizer who, as a part of his work, has helped workers file claims and get treatment. Troy, welcome to This is Nashville. And Charlie, thanks for staying with us. Thanks for having me. You know, I, I can you give us an overview of workers comp, the workers' compensation process? I mean, if everything goes right and goes according to plan, what happens from the moment someone gets injured while working? Right. So the process is the injured worker, uh, if it's a, a minor injury, there is a immediate reporting to the employer. Uh, the employer will then provide a panel or a list of three or more doctors to choose from in their local area. They could go to the doctor uh, and get medical treatment. If it's an emergency situation, obviously going straight to the ER is the thing to do. And then those panels of uh, specialists can be sorted out uh, and provided after that. But um, yeah, get, getting the injury reported, getting medical treatment, that's the first step. Um, if the injured worker is taken off work or put on work restrictions by the doctor uh, for more than seven days, that is a uh, situation where temporary disability benefits could be paid. Medical treatment is always covered under workers' comp. There's no deductible or copay, anything like that. 
and then going forward uh, uh, from that, uh, obviously the uh, insurance carrier and the employer would coordinate medical benefits, uh, medical appointments. We have about 90,000 work injuries in Tennessee every year. Most of those are minor in nature, uh, first aid, um, you know, shoulder, uh, knee injuries, things like that are really common. Uh, and, you know, most of those treatment is provided, no dispute, everything runs smoothly. But there are situations where there are disputes, and that's where the Bureau of Workers' Compensation comes in. We have mediators, ombudsmen, uh, we have a court system, appeals board, all of that is specially tailored for injured, wor- injured workers only, not uh, those judges and the mediators and ombudsmen. All they do all day, every day is treat injured workers and talk to injured workers and try to help injured workers and their employers uh, get through a workers' compensation claim. Is there anything different in what happens depending on the severity of an injury? Is there different protocols needed for someone who has to go to the emergency room? Right. No, I think if if there's an injury on the job site that requires emergency medical treatment, that injured worker uh, goes straight to the emergency room uh, and gets whatever emergency treatment they need. And then, you know, it goes forward from there as far as individual specialists and and things like that. But I think that's the main difference, uh, getting the emergency treatment immediately, uh, notifying the employer uh, the statute says immediately, but there is a 15-day maximum on reporting the injury. How should they report that? I mean, what does that? What can the documentation look like? Are text messages enough? Does it have to be formal? Statute says it has to be in writing. Uh, in this day and age, uh, we see text messaging, emailing, uh, very common handwritten uh, notices of injury that we used to see, not seeing that so much anymore. Now, explain something to me. When I was a teacher in Los Angeles, I was playing football with the kids. I jacked up my knee pretty bad. I didn't file a workers' compensation claim, and my employer continued to pay me, but I was also paying, I believe it was Aflac, who was giving me money for my medical bills. Are And when someone files a claim and they're out of work for a while, how much of their pay do they receive from their employer? They're off work due to a work injury. It's 66 and two thirds of their average weekly wage uh, until they're able to go back to work. Uh, if they're never able to go back to work and they're permanently and totally disabled, they're entitled to uh, temporary benefits until they reach Social Security old age retirement. Okay. And now, in general, what should all workers really keep in mind to protect themselves in the process of filing a workers' compensation claim? Well, I, you know, there are situations where an attorney would be helpful for an injured worker, particularly if it's a contested case, it's a bad injury. Uh, we do have at the Bureau of Workers' Compensation uh, a staff of ombudsmen. Uh, some of those are bilingual, uh, mediators, some bilingual. Uh, we have ombudsman attorneys who can assist with limited legal advice. Uh, so uh, I think. You know, if there's any kind of question or dispute, the the first step is to reach out to the Bureau of Workers' Compensation uh, Ombudsman line at 800-332-2667. And our website, uh, the, the URL is so long, I don't uh, know it off the top of my head, but Tennessee Bureau of Workers' Compensation, there's a ton of information on there that's super helpful. Maybe too much information, actually, mm-hmm. but... It's, it's a lot of good, helpful information, and I think that'd be the place to start. An overload of information can be a good thing, but it can also be tough, and people need help going through it. Charlie, you've tell people walk through and work through this process. Tell us, as a, you've done this as a union rep. What have you done to help folks, and what's that experience been like for them? So for our members, it's really just letting them know that they need to bring it up to the contractor if they haven't already. Our contractors are very well-trained. And they're very well educated and they know usually what they have to do. So usually at that point, they just let us know that, hey, you know, I got hurt on the job side. And we check up on them. You know, they're our brother, they're our sister. So we want them to be all right. So we'll we'll always check in on them. Um, With other workers um, doing outreach on job sites, they call me and they ask me right off the bat, like, hey, I... 
had a rebar go through my thigh and I was like, oh my God, are you mm. okay? Um, did you get medical attention? Like, that sounds pretty serious. And they're like, no, it only went on the side and hit any arteries and whatnot, but it's a pretty big gash. What, what, what should I do? Uh, I'm not in the job site anymore and they just sent me home. And I was just like, well, you need to get medical attention. It's the first thing you need to do. And you need to tell your employer to get on it and go from there on. Um, and, and it's just that, letting them know what the process is, like he said, um, making sure that it's reported to the employer, that they know about it, that they offer the three uh, places of medical care. They obviously have to distinguish if it's an emergency or an urgency at that point. I think a gash in the, in the thigh would be an emergency and they need to go. Um, but sometimes it's too late. Sometimes it's like a smash foot that uh, they had during demolition. And they tell me about it, and they told me that their employer already laid them off. They said, mm -hmm. hey, I don't need you, and they just dispose of them, like as if they were a broken tool. Is that legal at all? No, Joey? no. An uh, injured worker cannot be terminated for filing a workers' compensation claim. That would be a violation of state law, and the, uh, that employee would need to seek counsel. That's, that's separate from workers' comp, though. That's more of an employment law issue, but... Uh, but no, you're right. That that that's not supposed to happen. How often have you come into something like that, Charlie? Someone being injured on the job, and their employer terminating their 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 contract or their employment. It's actually gone down right now. I would say it's probably I hear that around maybe sixty seventy percent of the time that they've been terminated. Um, when I first started here about three years ago, it was an automatic. Mm. You're sent home. We don't want to hear from you. Your number's getting blocked. Go away. We can't use you anymore. What do you what do you what do you give credit to that drop in that rate to? Education. Going out there, talking with workers. I um, mean, we've even teamed up with other organizations in the community, and we've held uh, these uh, kind of forums where we speak about workers' rights and what you guys are entitled to, right? And it's just education. Keep on posting it, social media, telling others, um, and, and letting people know. And, I mean, the, the construction community is very tight-knit. Everybody knows somebody from another trade or from another company, and they're always going to try to help each other out. Mm. Now, Troy, does worker comp cover employees only? What about subcontractors? Every Tennessee employer must cover uh, their workers for uh, workers' compensation work injuries. In Tennessee, it's a five or more statute. It kind of varies from state to state. But in construction in Tennessee, every employer must cover all of their employees, even if it's one or more. So um, we have a team of investigators that go across the state investigating uh, job sites, tips that they get about uh, this particular employer doesn't have work comp coverage on their employees. Most of the time, uh, it's in the construction industry, but not all the time. There are, there are other industries that uh, this seemed to hap happen quite a bit, but um, it seems to be a major problem in construction. Uh, and a bigger question and a bigger problem is the misclassification of an employee as an uh, independent contractor, especially in the construction. How, how can someone know if they're an employee or a subcontractor? Generally, in the hiring process, uh, the employer and the employee uh, work that out amongst themselves that, you know, I'm, you know, employing you, I'm providing health insurance benefits, you're working for me no matter what job you're on, uh, what job site you're on. If it's an independent contractor situation, though, and there certainly are plenty of those in the, the trades industry where the uh, the independent contractor goes from one job to another and does different uh, work on different job sites. Uh, those are true uh, independent contractor situations. So uh, it, it's a case-by-case -case situation. The right to control the work is the key. And if, if the employer is controlling where the employee is going, the time they're there, it, basically telling them where to be, where to show up, and what to do, uh, that's probably an employer-employee relationship. All right, I got about 45 seconds left. Let me ask you this, Troy. What do workers need to keep in mind? What do they need to know to protect themselves when it comes to workers' compensation coverage? Yeah, so I think the uh, contact our office, uh, the Tennessee Bureau of Workers' Compensation, and we can check every employer to see if they have workers' comp coverage. 
And then if you have an injury, be sure and report that and ask for medical treatment. Ask for a, a list of doctors to choose from. The employer will provide you that. And if they don't, reach out to us and we'll help. And documentation, document everything that happens to you. That's important, right? Absolutely. Keep up with everything. Keep all your records. All right. Um, Troy Haley is the administrator for the Tennessee Bureau of Workers' Compensation. And Charlie Rodriguez is a labor leader here in Tennessee. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. Really appreciate it. No, thank you for having us. Thank you so much. And thanks to you for tuning in this hour. This is Nashville, is a production of Nashville Public Radio. Today's episode was produced by Catherine Cece's and Mary Mancini. It was directed by Tasha A.F. Lemley. Our technical director and board operators, Liv Lombardi. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. You can listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get good podcasts. And the conversation does not end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram. Tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. You can also call to leave us a message, 615-760-2000. We do listen to those messages, and we reach back out to you. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody, and be good to each other.